Uh, my name is Dermot Hester. I'm a Leverhulme Early Career Fellow in English. Uh, and my most recent project was a critical biography of Dennis Cooper, who is a poet, novelist, uh, and recently filmmaker, um, who's most widely known for his transgressive novels that he wrote in the 90s and the 2000s called The George Miles Cycle. Um, Currently, I'm researching a counter-history of New York's art and culture from the perspective of waste, um, which is to say I'm looking at New York-based artists in the 20th century and thinking about how they uh, think about waste as a concept and a material in their work. And I'm particularly interested in minoritarian cultures, which is to say um, artists and writers of colour, uh, queer artists and writers who kind of respond to their own social marginalization by um, by employing waste in order to kind of push back against that. Um, and I, with that in mind, I uh, organized a symposium recently um, with the support of the Faculty of English and LGBTQ plus at CAM uh, called Trash, Waste and Excess in Queer Cultures, uh, which tried to kind of take an interdisciplinary point of view on queer waste. Why do you research queer studies? Uh, I was first introduced to queer studies in the last year of my undergraduate degree at University College Dublin when I took a class in queer readings of film with a queer theorist named Michael O'Rourke and Michael and Noreen Giffney who was his colleague at UCD um, they had this wonderful series, this research series on queer theory called Theories, uh, Advanced Seminars in Queer Research. And they invited uh, a kind of uh, who's who of queer theory to come and speak. Judith Butler, Jack Haberstam, um, Sarah Ahmed, David Halperin and so on. And so I was really lucky to be able to see these great speakers um, uh, very early on in my career. And it was very inspiring. And I went from there to uh, University of Sussex, where I um, took a master's in sexual dissidence and cultural change, um, which was the first queer studies postgraduate degree in, in Britain. And it was set up in 1991 by Alan Sinfield and Jonathan Dollymore. And in Alan's classes, uh, I was introduced to a, a, a wide range of um, really inspiring um, uh, politically engaged cultural producers. So I first read Leslie Feinberg, the trans and butch lesbian activist um, in Alan's sexuality fiction and subculture class. Um, I first encountered the work of uh, black filmmaker Marilyn Riggs and of course um, I first read Dennis Cooper's work there which um, Who's, yeah, I would go on to do my PhD on Dennis. Have you ever faced challenges in queer research or teaching? Um, I suppose I've been very lucky in, in, in being supported in the work that I do. Um, I think a lot of that came from doing my PhD at the University of Sussex, um, which, as I say, has this tradition of, of supporting um, queer studies and uh, research into sexual dissidence, which is really important for the work that I do because um, Dennis Cooper's work is not, well, it's, it's quite controversial and it's transgressive, so that was really great for me. The one challenge that I can remember, and that really sticks in my, my memory, was um, actually by another queer researcher um, when I was just starting out. I overheard him say, um, something to the effect that um, what is Dermot doing researching queer studies? I've never seen him kiss a boy. And I mean, I've identified as queer for a very long time and I've had relationships with men and women. And this struck me as like a really, you know, biphobic comment, right? Um, and it really upset me. And um, But to be honest, um, it kind of helped me to develop a critical relationship to the queer research community, which I think is really important. And I think um, it disabused me of the idea very early that queer research is without prejudice. And I think um, to, to think about queer research in a critical way, it allows us to see that yes, over its history, it has been 
biphobic, it has been uh, misogynistic, it may have sidelined trans voices. And I think that's really important going forward to think about the, um, the, the prejudices and omissions that queer studies has had. Why is it important to have a queer curriculum? Uh, two reasons. The first, uh, I guess, is to do with representation. Uh, it's really important that our students, um, young people who are queer identified or LGBTQ identified or, you know, even students that are just still working things out with regards to their sexuality, that they um, see perspectives in their curricula that um, connect with them or that uh, align with them or ground those perspectives historically. Um, and also, I think, as Caroline said, Caroline Gonda said um, in, a, in a previous one of these videos, it's important that straight students also have the opportunity to um, enlarge their, their world, their world view and encounter uh, queer topics. I think there's a second reason, which is more societal, I suppose, that um, the university as an institution confers legitimacy on topics and I think that you know even 50 years after gay liberation um, queer topics are, are still marginal and marginalized and I think including more and more queer topics and subjects and writers on curricula um, lends them a, a certain legitimacy in the eyes of the public and um, says to uh, the public that these are social issues that, that need to be, um, that, that deserve to be addressed and that need to be studied. How do you queer the curriculum? Okay, um, I think to queer the curriculum is a little bit more difficult than simply including queer topics in a curriculum. I think it's slightly different and I think, uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. At the Modern Language Association meeting uh, earlier this year in Chicago, on a panel called uh, New Keywords in Queer Studies, um, Jinga Desai, the sexualities scholar, um, proposed uh, promiscuity as a new keyword. Uh, and by this she meant that queer um, should continue to refuse to be ontologically, epistemologically, uh, methodologically pure um, or what you, what you call proper. Um, in other words, that it should court a kind of promiscuity, discipline-wise. Um, now, it turns out this isn't all that new a keyword. Um, as early as you know, 2003, Jack Haberstam in a, an article called um, Regarding Queer Studies and Queer Pedagogy um, said something very similar and he wrote that uh, queer studies discipline wise was a promiscuous rogue in a field of monogamists um, and that queer studies has a responsibility to challenge disciplinary boundaries. Um, so I think it's really important that we bear these kinds of meanings of queer um, in mind when we talk about querying the curriculum and, and that we teach and we research uh, in, in interdisciplinary ways and, and try to think beyond our own discipline. So that's something that I've tried to do in, in my uh, critical biography on Dennis Cooper, bringing kind of biographical and historical, sociological, literary um, forces to bear, or ideas to bear on, on his work. I think it's also something that LGBTQ plus at CAM are doing in terms of encouraging an interdisciplinary conversation. So, yeah, I mean, to queer the curriculum, um, one way is to think beyond the kind of silos of knowledge um, of, of the institution and uh, make alliances with um, other uh, disciplines and other uh, scholars in other disciplines.